Wim's recently come out with their Vibelink amplifier. This guy. This little amp puts out about 100 watts per channel at 8 ohm, has a near noiseless noise floor, and it really doesn't care what speaker you hook it up to. And if you recognize the format and the function, you'll see that it looks very similar to their other products, such as the Wim Amp Pro or the Wim Ultra Streamer. Now you may be thinking, why would I need an amplifier if I've already got the Wim Amp Pro? Well, number one, this has about twice the power. So if you've been feeling like your system just doesn't get loud enough or doesn't have enough punch or dynamicism to it, maybe you need to upgrade to something a little bit more powerful. And this would be the next logical step when you also combine it with something like the Wim Ultra Streamer. Now, in my case, I gave away the Wim Ultra Streamer to a Patreon member a few months ago. So I had to hook it up to the lowly Macintosh C55 preamplifier. But this guy will work off of just about any preamp. As long as you have optical toss link, coaxial digital, or analog RCA, you can plug it up to this guy and get to rocking. Now, the price for this is about $299. If you pair this with the Wim Ultra Streamer, you're in for about 630 bucks. Whereas if you get the Wim Amp Pro, you can get everything bundled into one unit for about $380. The main difference again is gonna be power and do you need it and does this guy deliver it? So let's talk about that in this video. The Vibelink uses the Texas Instruments TPA3255 chip for amplification. It also includes an ESS DAC chip supporting 24-bit 192 kilohertz PCM VO coax, optical or USB-C. You also get the RCA phono inputs as well. And it also has a trigger input, which is a nice feature to have. That way your preamp can trigger this amplifier on and you don't have to worry about getting up and manually turning it off. This amplifier will power pretty much any speaker you can throw at it. I've got about eight different speakers sitting out of the boxes right now. And out of those eight, I played around with about four of them, ranging anywhere from $100 speakers to about $5,000 a pair of speakers. I didn't have any issue driving any of these speakers to an output level that I would be satisfied. However, I will say that I tend to listen at higher output levels because I'm a little bit further away from the speakers. For this reason, I run a pair of Macintosh MC611s. So let's start off with some data and we'll walk through some of this. Now the self noise of this amplifier is about five microvolts. That's really, really, really low. And unless you are literally listening to high sensitivity speakers with your ear right next to them, you're not gonna hear any noise from this amplifier itself. And that's a personal pet peeve of mine, noisy components that just deliver, psh, can't stand that stuff. This amplifier does not have load variability. In other words, it doesn't matter what speaker you connect to it, the frequency response of the amplifier itself does not change. And we can see that from this data here. Now in my testing, I use static loads and reactive loads. The static loads are the standard two, four and eight ohm resistor banks. Everybody's got those. But my reactive loads are designed to simulate two different types of speakers. One is a simple load and the other is a complex load. I have the data for these on my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com, if you wanna see what those look like. In this data, we can see that all of these have very little effect on the response linearity of this amplifier. The simple and the complex do cause a little bit of a deviation, but we're talking about a tenth of a decibel, not anything to worry about. This amplifier is rated at 100 watts at 8 ohm and 200 watts at 4 ohm. And the question is, does it make rated power? Well, the answer is yes, but there's a little bit of a caveat. So let's look at this data real fast. What we have is THD plus noise on the Y axis, and we have power on the X axis. On the far left, you typically are dominated by noise. So you have a higher noise floor right here. And as you increase the power going this way, you get above the noise threshold, you have lower noise floor, but then at some point you turn the corner and you start to ramp up in distortion. And then when you ramp up into distortion, usually that happens really quickly. So you'll go from practically no distortion to a lot of distortion very fast we see that the simple and the eight ohm loads have about 75 watts or so before they hit this knee. Once they hit this knee, they ramp up in distortion pretty quickly. And at 1%, they are above 100 watts. If you look at the four ohm and the complex load, so four ohm in purple, complex in black, the knee is around 150 to 170 watts. 
when you ramp up to 1% right through here, you're above the 200 watt. And if we talk about max power in terms of continuous and then quick dynamic transient, with continuous at eight ohm, you're about 113 watts. With dynamic, you're at about 114 watts. With four ohm for max continuous, you're at 207 watts. And quick dynamic transients, you're at about 213 watts. Now you may be wondering, why is the continuous and the instantaneous power pretty much the same? I mean, th there's like a couple watts difference, but that's about it. Most class AB amplifiers will have a pretty decent spread, maybe from one to two decibels. So you're talking a little bit more power or almost doubling in power between the continuous and the instantaneous. Well, this is because of the class D design. And depending on your viewpoint, you could say this is a good thing or a bad thing. So the class D design is so efficient that it's able to achieve maximum power at the same continuous power. Whereas class AB amplifiers typically are not as efficient. So if you're feeding them a continuous signal, they're only gonna give you so much power out. But if you hit them with a quick burst, they're gonna give you more power. So depending on how you look at it, the Class D amplifiers having lower headroom uh, could be a good thing. Now let's wrap up and talk about the build and aesthetics. Now one thing that I really like about this amplifier is the built-in speaker plugs. Rather than having a big banana jack on the back of it or a binding post or something like that, you've got an inset banana jack. I really like that. It just makes the overall look and aesthetic better. I like the aluminum chassis. I like the heft to the design and the volume knob on the front doesn't change the internal noise. So when I talked about the noise earlier, that was with the volume knob at minimum and then again at maximum. I think this works great in a medium sized room. Now, if you're listening at really far distances, you may want some extra power and yeah, 200 watts at four ohm is a lot of power. But if you're listening in a very large room and you're pretty far away, you may find that you want some extra dynamic transient power that maybe a larger class AB temp might temp amp might give you. This is an amplifier that does not call attention to itself. Now you may like an amplifier that calls attention to itself or you may not. That's your choice. But this does the job. $300. It gives you 100 watts at 8 ohm, 200 watts at 4 ohm very low noise floor and just an overall nice sleek look. And as a parting note, I'll say this. When I test amplifiers, I kind of beat up on them pretty hard. I run them for hours at a time. I run them into static loads. I run them into complex loads. I run them at low volume, high volume. If they're going to fail, usually I'm going to break it in my review session. Now I've broken two amplifiers before this one, stood the test of time. The only issue that I ever had was sometimes I would feed it too much voltage for too long and it would basically just shut itself down. It would mute its output circuits altogether. But that's easily resolved by pushing the reset button on the back and then it booted right back up. So in terms of product quality and longevity, I think that you should have no problems with this. Now I can't guarantee anything, but based on my pretty hardcore testing, I can't imagine that the common consumer is going to have any serious issues with this. And that does it for this review. I'll have full measurements up on my website soon at aaronsaudiocorner.com. If you'd like to support what I'm doing here, you can do so one of two ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash aaronsaudiocorner, where you'll get some sneak peeks behind the scenes. You'll get polls. Sometimes I do giveaways there. Sometimes I sell stuff that I'm not using anymore, and I'll make a good deal on it. Another way you can help me out is to use any of my generic affiliate links in the description below. They will take you to Amazon or Crutchfield and anything that you need to buy from there using that link earns me a small commission at no additional cost to you. So if you got to buy it already, think of me, click the link, go buy it, whatever it is. Amazon socks, cool. Crutchfield television or speakers, cool. It's all good. And I appreciate it. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace. I almost did it in reverse. Peace.